Hi there everyone, my name is Luke and welcome to my channel. And also welcome to part two of my budget reflector versus premium refractor series, where I'm hoping to compare results taken with my budget reflector, the Skywatcher 150 PDS, to results taken using all the same gear, apart from the scope, using my premium refractor, the Skywatcher Esprit 120 triplet. So some of you may have seen this if you have notifications enabled on my channel. Um, I put up a poll on my uh, YouTube and asked you guys what you'd like to see compared first. And you've all voted and it looks like the thing that you'd like to see is actually the Cygnus wall compared first. So that's what I'm gonna be shooting over the course of the next few nights as it looks set to stay clear actually for a good few. I'm just going to set a time lapse off now and probably get the scope carried out and we can talk a little bit more before the night draws in. Well, everything's out and set up now and it's just a matter of waiting for it to all cool down and finally finish getting dark. Um, the nights are finally drawing in a little bit now. Um, should get maybe three, perhaps a little bit more solid hours of imaging in tonight with any luck. Um, it's probably gonna get dark by around about nearing midnight and start lighting up again by about three in the morning. Um, hopefully I can get a little bit of extra time on the back and front side of that, but we'll soon see. But yeah, it really feels good to be back outside, able to make these videos, to share with all you guys, um, to take photos again. It just seems a real waste having all that astronomy gear just kind of sat there in the kitchen doing absolutely nothing. It just looks pretty. Um, but yeah, with any luck, this weather should hold for a little while now. It seems like there's been some uh, high pressure coming in and that usually brings quite settled weather with it. So uh, fingers crossed on that one. I'd actually hoped to make a start on this video last night uh, as it promised to be clear. Um, during the day I went to go visit Scarborough with my girlfriend, that's a, uh, a seaside town on Yorkshire's east coast and it's a really pretty place. If ever you get the chance to go or if you've been you'll know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's overlooked by uh, a 12th century castle that's on the cliffs above it so it's quite a picturesque little place. And uh, yeah, that was a really nice way to spend the day and relax. And, and like I said, I did hope to actually start this video then, but by the time we got home, uh, well, I was tired, but I would have done it. Um, but perhaps worst of all, it had completely clouded out. So there was really nothing I could do. So here we are the day after. But anyway, back on the topic of the video. Um, during those two weeks, there was one little break and uh, I've been kind of watching the sky like a hawk every single night, poking my head out of the door hoping for a clear one and uh, they were kind of a patchy night and I thought uh, I'm gonna actually try and I did. I set everything up and I got about 20 minutes before it clouded out but um, that might sound totally dire but it actually turned out to be totally worth it because it gave me the chance to get everything in focus, check my collimation was correct, uh, see the actual field coverage of that field flattener, the Aplan Attic on the 150 PDS on a sensor of this size because uh, up until previously the, the largest sensor I'd ever used it on was um, a four thirds sensor like the 1600mm Pro size sort of camera so with this being a DSLR size sensor, an APS-C I was kind of a little bit worried that it wouldn't fully cover it but uh, it seems like it's doing an absolutely phenomenal job I have absolutely no complaints there so uh, with any luck now, uh, these images that it produces should be up to quite a high standard. Before I forget as well, there was one other thing. Um, I actually took some notes on that night uh, to remind me for when I made this video, but yeah, one other thing that bothered me um, almost immediately was not having autofocus. You don't really realize just how much you miss things like that until they're, they're gone. Uh, I didn't really think I'd mind as much as I did, but here we are. Um, 
I tried fitting my Sesto Senso to the 150 PDS, but due to the fact that I've got an extremely long dovetail on it, that large Losmandi bar, it pushes the tube rings apart so far that the actual body of the Sesto Senso would collide with um, the front tube ring. So unfortunately, in my case, it's kind of a no-go. So when I'd made the first video in this series, um, a lot of really kind people left uh, quality comments for me and little bits of tips and tricks and things that I'd totally forgot to actually include in the video. Um, one of them basically mentioned how perhaps I should rotate the, uh, the tube around in the rings so that the camera if in effect is facing downwards which gets the off axis weight of that camera, focuser, corrector, all those things um, down closer to the centre of mass and also to the centre of rotation like the axis um, which does actually help with balancing um, and it is something I would have done where I'm using a slightly larger scope. The reason I didn't is because it's actually quite a lot easier for me to collimate this. I use visual tools to collimate. Um, so I don't have to crane my neck getting underneath to look uh, through those when it's in this configuration but indeed in the past when I had larger uh, Newtonians that actually required every advantage that I could possibly muster to get a good state of balance uh, I always did use them in that configuration so uh, rotated 180 degrees from where the camera is currently now I'll try and dig up a picture I think of my old 300 PDS um, and that should show it as well but yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed for leaving that tip. There were a few more. I'll try and uh, touch upon those now. So another really good comment was about the wind factor on Newtonians. Um, and that's really kind of something that I totally, totally forgot about after using my refractor for so long. It's not really a problem with this because it is a very small Newtonian, but again, on my larger ones, it's a little bit windy tonight, maybe with, I would say 15 miles per hour gusts or so. One of my old 10 or 12 inch or maybe even the 8 inch newts uh, would have been totally unusable on a night like tonight. Um, you couldn't have done any long exposure imaging whatsoever. So unless you'd be satisfied with lots and lots of short exposures and getting rid of all the ones with gusty wind trails in them, um, it's kind of a no-go. So you'd always be looking at owning a second scope really with a large newton unless you were extremely patient. There was one other interesting comment talking about diffraction spikes and uh, that's again something I should probably brought up. Um, that's something you're going to see with any telescope design that has kind of a spider secondary support. Um, you won't see it on like a Maxitov Newtonian or a schmidt cassegrain indeed because their um, secondary mirrors are connected to a corrector plate so it doesn't correct, create that kind of spiked diffraction that you see created by a spider vein. Um, and a lot of people don't like them, uh, but I'm not one of them. I actually really think that good diffraction spikes, if they're not all split up and looking strange, really add to an image rather than take away from it. But um, I may be a little bit biased because of kind of the age I am. I grew up watching lots of pictures of Hubble on TV, on Discovery, things like that. And uh, that's probably altered my outlook on diffraction spikes because, of, of course, like Hubble is a rich Cretian telescope as far as I remember uh, and all its images have diffraction spikes so it's just one of those things that I've grown to I guess love seeing in my images actually I do miss it when I'm imaging with a refractor well now I've talked your ears off for a while uh, I'm gonna go inside and wait a little bit for it to get ever so slightly darker then I'm gonna come out and get polar aligned make sure everything's in focus and start my imaging session on the Cygnus wall Well, it's just turned midnight and I've got myself plate solved and aligned. I actually used Deneb beforehand as a uh, focusing star as it's nearby the target that I want to shoot and relatively bright because I'm obviously back to manual focusing now. I need to uh, generally, unless there's a bright star in the field of view that I'm shooting, I need to move away and find one to use the Binov mask on. So that's all done. There's a few wispy clouds out and about. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to pass relatively quickly because they're not really everywhere in the sky it's just a few 
around and they're not actually in the field of uh, view that I'm shooting right now so I'm not too worried unless they move across which would be just my luck but <laughs> that's another story um, but yeah hopefully this is the start of the project uh, I'm going to be shooting with 10 minute exposures at gain 100 exactly the same settings as I used when shooting it with the Esprit and I'm hoping to accumulate a good few hours of exposure between tonight and tomorrow night and maybe even the night after, we'll see how things go. Well, it's about half past one in the morning and frame number eight has just finished behind me. Um, looks like I'm probably going to get another eight more frames before dawn starts to break according to the uh, the deep sky darkness calculator in astrophotography tool and uh, yeah I would say everything's going exceptionally well. It's a really really good night tonight. The sky is pretty crystalline, uh, there's not much twinkle happening on the stars so I would expect the air column above us is quite steady. And uh, these subframes as they come in, just looking at them like panning around the frame one to one size. Um, yeah, they're very high resolution, it looks like things are going just perfectly well. Um, guiding has also been extremely, extremely accurate tonight. And uh, yeah, it's just good things really, I can't complain at all. Uh, especially after this break, coming back to it now and everything working just straight away is a bit of a godsend really, so uh, I'm happy for that. Well, I've got the scope out here again, but it's not to shoot the wall anymore because that project is now finished and processed. And I have to say, what a beautiful end result. It's way better than I could have ever hoped for, actually. Um, and indeed, I actually think I've ended up with a better end result than I captured with the Esprit, which is uh, kind of mind boggling to me, given the price difference between these two scopes. Um, I hope that the coming comparison I should put on screen in a moment is going to be of use to some of you guys um, and hopefully inspire you to just get out there and try with whatever equipment you have because at least to me it's really proved that you don't need to spend thousands on a scope to take a high quality image. Um, certainly there's nothing about this image that puts me off using this scope again it's, it's just been an absolute pleasure and that's why I'm back out with it again ready for the next project but yeah, I'd just like to say thank you all very much indeed for staying and watching. I uh, hugely appreciate your support. I hope uh, everybody knows that. But yeah, uh, until next time, I look forward to seeing you all and uh, stay safe and clear skies.